Welcome to the Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. Thanks for downloading this edition of the Why Factor from the BBC. I hope you enjoy the programme. BBC World Service. I'm Mike Williams with The Y Factor. Today, a fabric and a garment. Once clothes for working men, now they're worn by by anyone. Sometimes it seems by everyone. This item of clothing, unlike any other, has taken over the world. Today, denim and jeans. Denim embodies a kind of cool because denim is casual and it's very individual. I'm so hooked up on denim and if I see some heavy faded denim, for me it's like I'm living in paradise. Jeans have have almost transcended their stories of origin to become just jeans. They're so ubiquitous. They're worn from Azerbaijan to Zimbabwe, from Greenland in the north to the southernmost towns of Chile. There are places in the world where you won't see blue jeans, but not many. Here's Paul Trinker, author of Denim, From Cowboys to the Catwalk. The French claim it because the original term is Serge de Nîmes. From the city of Nîmes. Yes. Serge de Nîmes was a fabric that looks a lot like denim, although it was actually made with wool and cotton. And there are pictures from, I think, the late 1600s of Italian kids in what really looks like today's workwear. It looks like denim. It's even got the kind of brightly contrasting stitching that we associate with denim. But again, that was a kind of wool and cotton fabric. But really, modern denim as we know it first basically became popular in America in the 1850s. So the fabric, or something like it, had been around for a while, dyed with indigo from plantations in India. But jeans as we know them came a little later, with the meeting of a Russian, Jakob Jufes, and a German, Loeb Strauss. Like so many of the new immigrants to America at the time, they changed their names on arrival. Jacob Davis and Levi Strauss. It's a story about innovation, a story about collaboration, and it goes back to 1870s. Tracy Panek is the corporate historian at Levi Strauss and Company, based in San Francisco. There was a tailor in Reno, Nevada, whose name was Jacob Davis, and he'd been asked to make a very sturdy pair of work pants, and he had a hunch that if he took a piece of small metal rivet and put it in the stress points of a pair of pants, right around the pocket area, he could create a very durable pair of pants. And that's what he did. And the hunch proved correct. Uh, The pants were so well received that word started to spread and he got so many requests for the pants that he decided to write to his fabric supplier, uh, Levi Strauss in San Francisco, and ask if he was interested in taking out a patent. Levi Strauss agreed. He was a seasoned businessman at this point and was ready to take on a new adventure. He invited Jacob Davis to move to San Francisco, where the two endeavored to uh, begin manufacturing what would become the world's first blue jeans. So who did he sell them to? Anyone from miners to railroad engineers, cowboys, teamsters, farriers, men who worked with horses. They were originally created for working men, and some of our early flyers, our early advertisements had taglines like, for honest working men. We've got early invoices that show that you could buy a dozen pair uh, copper riveted denim waist overalls for about $12 for a dozen. I know there is a world of collectors out there. How much would it cost them to get their hands on one of those very early jeans if they could be found? We have our very oldest pair of Levi's jeans in the archives. They're valued uh, between about $100,000 and $150,000. There aren't many collectors with that kind of money to spend on jeans, but there are collections just as astounding. My name is Rudi Karrer. I was born in Switzerland, in a remote village with 40 people living there. 
and born in 1959 and collecting raw denim jeans since 42 years. I'm so hooked up on denim and if I see some heavy faded denim, for me it's like I'm living in paradise. In the remote place where I grew up, we just had the brown corduroy pants and no jeans was available there. And we were a poor big family, 12 people, and we received a lot of clothes donation parcels. In one of the parcels in 1970, there were two pairs of Levi's jeans. And since then, I'm completely addicted on denim. For me, it's like a fetish. It's also a, a part of a revolution. You have many pairs of jeans. Now there are about 7,000 pairs of jeans and about 5,000 denim jackets from the 50s until now. What do you do with them? Most of them are stored in a room and more impressive samples that are displayed in another room. And I want to try to keep the raw denim spirit alive with displaying the power of denim evolution. These days, almost anyone can wear a pair of jeans. There are some local traditions, of course, some places where Western dress is frowned upon, where women in particular are restricted in what they can wear. But everywhere else, you'll find jeans, worn by men and women, children and their grandparents, doctors and dock workers, miners, missionaries and supermodels. The project that I did in London, what we found was that actually people wore jeans because they wanted to be ordinary. Sophie Woodward, a sociologist at Manchester University in the UK. Her research in London was part of the Global Denim Project, a look at the history, extent, economics and consequences of denim's world domination. This desire and interest in being ordinary very much arose out of the presence of a multicultural city and people just wanted to get on with their lives. But at the same time, they knew they could do that through jeans because jeans weren't seen as being from anywhere because they're present in countries throughout the world. They weren't seen as being particularly American. They weren't seen as being from people's countries of origins. They weren't even seen as being particular to London or the UK. And as a consequence, the globalness of jeans is the thing that allowed people in that specific context to wear them as a, a feature of ordinary. They just wanted to be able to live their lives, to be a mother, to be a worker, to be all those kinds of things. And actually, jeans didn't make them visible. Jeans have, have almost transcended their stories of origin to become just jeans. They're so ubiquitous. According to the Global Denim Project, its research suggests that on any single day, the majority of the world's population is wearing at least one item of this textile. Denim embodies a kind of cool, because denim is casual, and it's very individual. The whole point about denim is it wears in a different way for each individual who wears it. That's basically the template that everyone follows for denim. Of course, in the 1890s and 1900s, when it was invented, it was mainly workwear for, for miners, etc. 1930s, it became associated with cowboys. The Levi Strauss Company were based near Hollywood, so already you'll see in the 1930s it becomes a kind of something that film stars and fashion models would wear. In 1934, we revolutionized women's fashion by introducing the very first pair of blue jeans for women. They were called Lady Levi's. And a year after we introduced those Lady Levi's, Vogue magazine featured a story about our Lady Levi's. And it was a story about dude ranches, which is uh, people who would travel to the West, stay on a working horse or cattle ranch, and have a Western experience. And, of course, they wanted to not only have that experience, but they wanted to dress the part. And the Vogue magazine article in 1935 describes just what the best-dressed woman on a dude ranch would be wearing. And that would be a pair of Lady Levi's jeans, cuffed, a pair of cowboy boots, a Stetson hat, and you had to have a great air of bravado. And then really by the 1940s, you had a bunch of essentially uh, mostly Navy servicemen coming back to the West Coast, forming biker gangs. They would all wear denim. Therefore, you have this kind of proliferation of youth culture. Uh, Neil Cassidy, who is really the subject of Kerouac's On the Road, used to wear denim, so it's mentioned in On the Road. And then you get the early rockers who were wearing denim as well. We're 
And then, of course, you have Marlon Brando and James Dean, other people wearing denim. So really, by about 1953, 1954, 1955, it's established as, as a template. Really, all you need to look cool is a pair of jeans, a white T-shirt, and maybe a pair of engineer boots. After World War II, there was quite a shift from work wear into leisure wear and fashion wear, but it took some getting used to. And there were a number of people who had very strong feelings about our jeans. So actually, for many schools, Levi's jeans were banned because they were considered connected with juvenile delinquents. So how does it go from being the symbol of youth rebellion to something that is so ubiquitous today? Well, of course, youth culture has been turned into a commodity. It's the whole process of revolt into style, isn't it? So therefore, when George W. Bush and Tony Blair went marching out together in blue jeans, they were making a statement they were cool guys. Um, but, of course, denim has the ability to basically change according to the wearer. There's an infinite variation in how denim can look because of how it wears, how it's cut. So, actually, you'd think denim would have been killed off as a, as a kind of youth fabric because of people like Blair and Bush. But all that happens is people wear it in a different way. They wear them skinny or they wear them dark. So, it can basically change its feel for each succeeding generation. And that's really what's kept it fresh. We found that people had different types of jeans and different categories that allowed them to do different things. So, for example, one man we worked with had a pair of black Armani jeans that he used to wear to a family party or a special occasion. He had different jeans that he used to wear if he was going to the football and he had different jeans that he wore at home and different jeans for gardening. So that's one example, but that's very common amongst people to use jeans to differentiate that. So a lot of women, for example, within the research had going out jeans. And so they had different gradations, and I think jeans allowed them to kind of do different things. It allowed them to feel safe, so they never felt like they were wearing the wrong thing, because you can never be wrong with a pair of jeans, but they had different types that allowed them to feel that they were wearing the right thing to different kinds of social occasions. I had my jeans on every day, so it was the same pair of jeans now, 745, every day in a row. 745 days with the same pair of jeans on? Yeah, they are still alive. <laughs> without <laughs> washing strong. Without yeah. washing them? Yeah, because I don't want to lose the colour tone. So how do you clean them? I have some tricks. I lay down my jeans every week for 10, 15 minutes outside under the sunlight and kill the bacteria. And I'm also uh, wearing them one size too big so that I'm not sweating too much in them. I'm wearing jeans all year round, every day. Also on funeral, on weddings, whatever. Isn't that a bit disrespectful? No, I have uh, some uh, very new, very dark jeans, so they are looking like almost like a suit, so it's no big deal. And what are your favourite jeans? Iron Heart, 25 ounce. It's a very thick denim fabric, and they are quite expensive probably 200 pounds or a little bit more even because it's very limited. They, they do it just uh, in a few hundred pairs or because it's very difficult to produce them because of the very heavy fabric. It's a Japanese brand. Japan is interesting because that's where you get the super fans of jeans. The super fans all want to have the Japanese denim and that's kind of seen as the sort of pinnacle of uh, the most authentic denim. Why? They originally set out about copying these original American jeans, but actually now Japanese jeans are seen as being more authentic. So there's a really interesting shift there in that actually if you talk to anyone who's really passionate about jeans, they will tell you that it's all about kind of Japanese denim. And it's because it goes back to the roots of denim. It goes back to the kind of salvage jeans, the really thick, heavy denim, and it tries to replicate those as much as possible. So they've recreated this kind of cheap, solid workwear. Yes, but it's certainly not cheap. It's very, very expensive. <laughs> um, How buy, expensive? I would say hundreds of pounds. I think actually if you wear them in the way that they suggest you wear them, you can develop a really long-term relationship to your pair of jeans, which was kind of what used to happen with jeans before all sorts of fashion interventions and distressing and pre-washing has happened to them. Oxford Street in central London. It's a busy corner and every second people are passing me wearing jeans. Blue jeans, black jeans, jeans to the left, jeans to the right. A denim shirt here, a denim skirt. A man in double denim, jacket and jeans. A young girl, maybe nine years old. Jeans and a denim jacket. 
paint spattered jeans on a workman. And also something quite remarkable, jeans in tatters, jeans ripped and torn on a, a young woman here wearing jeans that look a hundred years old. They're faded and frayed. It looks like Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis could easily have stitched them themselves, but they could very easily have been bought new this morning. Jeans are possibly the only thing that you would buy pre-torn and damaged. We buy jeans battered, torn, you know, sand washed. Isn't that insane? I think part of it comes from the original appeal, one of the big appeals of denim, is the ways in which they become so personalised. They wear down with your body. So as your body rubs against them, they take on your body shape. And that was always one of the kind of original appeals of denim as they became kind of associated with sort of subcultures in the 70s, you know, linked to particular hippies, for example. And I think actually... Now it's almost as if people don't have the time to wear in their jeans. They just want to buy them pre-worn and pre-distressed. So they have the aesthetic of looking like they've loved and worn their jeans for decades, but actually they haven't. They bought them sort of last week. And they've got some somebody in a Chinese or Bangladeshi factory to, to rip holes in them for them so they don't Precisely, have to. yeah. And, I mean, also it has devastating consequences as well because sandblasting, for example, has been known to cause sort of mortality in denim factories as well. That faded look is probably fabricated, made in factories where the air can be filled with a dust that causes lung disease. The indigo dye is largely synthetic these days, and according to the Worldwide Fund for Nature, it takes 11,000 litres of water to make a single pair of jeans. They may be cool, but they're costly, yet still the world seems to be in love with them. It's been with us for close on two centuries. Do you think it'll still be with us in two more? Each succeeding generation tends to adapt denim to their own style. And a fabric that looks better as it gets older, it's like the perfect invention. I associate my own jeans wearing with the fact that I can't really be bothered to make more of an effort and the fact that I'm a bit lazy when it comes to choosing what to wear. This nap sounds very, very familiar. <laughs> and I've got about probably three or four pairs of jeans. I tend to buy them in two or three at a time and just wear them to destruction. Yeah, well, that's, that's the way to do it. That's the original way to wear jeans. So, <laughs> <laughs> so nice to be authentic for once. That's yeah. <laughs> what other garment is there that's 130, 140 years old and basically is still, or is in fact even more stylish today than it was then? It's quite incredible. Thanks for listening to The Y Factor. If you'd like to hear more, there's a wide range of programmes on our website. Everything from the influence of television on our lives to myths about mirrors, the mentality of the mob and the kiss. Visit bbcworldservice.com forward slash Y Factor.